Um, there's probably some in the like YouTube free sound effects. Stuff. Well, there's also yeah, I'm sure there's one on freesound.org too. Um, okay. Oh, wait, um, we gotta stop typing. I know, sorry. I was getting one We haven't started. Before. We haven't started just yet. Okay. Um, Don't Sorry, I'm ready when you are. <laughs> Jackson said I literally defended you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, Why do I not get to show the same thing? Exactly. Hello, friends, family, compatriots romans countrymen all of them probably mostly family and friends <laughs> welcome back to the green light green podcast light. thank you lauren i am jackson i am lauren as i said and we are back it's great to be back this is uh episode seven for us yes. which is super exciting wow yeah we are trucking along yeah we are three away from another milestone of 10 Yay! yeah and i don't know i guess we can go ahead and we have a tease we are dropping something at episode 10. Yes. That's all we're going to say. something fun. Right now. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it's a fun, exciting thing. Yeah. We have We have a few, or at least I have an idea of something we can do as we drop this thing that we're, we're deciding on to make it even more fun. Yes. We will talk off air about that. I'm sure off air, <laughs> off podcast, oh whatever. Um, but yeah, so we're back. Um, so this is a podcast where we take scripts, plays... All of the like, we read them on, we interview the writers, and we just provide a little bit of good art, I yeah. think, for, for the people. Anything to add to that, Lauren? I know you usually Yeah, do I this. mean, we also prop up some, some other art uh, in our detours of the week, mm -hmm. which is when we talk about a book, a movie, a TV series, whatever... Uh, that we enjoyed, that we consumed in the past week. Yes. And if you have a detour of the week that you would like us to read mm -hmm. on this show, mm -hmm. then you can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts slash iTunes. It's the yep. little the little purple app with the little white outline person. <laughs> if you don't know what <laughs> <laughs> Just Apple follow Podcasts the link is. on our Facebook page and our Twitter, Instagram bio, whatever. It will mm -hmm. take you there. And you can leave a five-star review. It has a little more weight than a rating if you write something. You mm -hmm. can leave your detour of the week. Or you can roast Jackson. And we True. will read either of those on the podcast. True. Someone please roast me. Dear God. Besides his brother. That was a <laughs> fake roast. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It was more of a, a gassing up. If yeah, you yeah, yeah. Uh, my head is barely big enough. Or barely small enough to fit <laughs> in this closet now. After That's right. that. But, uh, so there's that. We also have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter on Twitter and Instagram we're TGL underscore pod. Go follow yes. us over on there. I on think Facebook, our content's fun. On Facebook, because uh, I know some people have had trouble searching the the page itself. You can actually search at Green Light Pod, all one word on Facebook, and that'll that take you to our page. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's I had fun. to choose an at name when I made the page. Oh, nice. Well, and there you go. At so Green Light do pod. one of those things. I think our content's pretty fun. I think we've, it's pretty fun. We, we've been. We do uh, some episodes out of context posts, you know, yeah. so you can try to try to guess what's coming up in the next week. Exactly. So it's a good time. Yeah, we we do a little preview of all of our writers on our um on our pages as well. Yeesh. So you you get to see a little bit about who you're gonna be hearing as well yeah. in that interview, and yeah. So so that all is that on that stuff. is that all the housekeeping things we have? I think those are all the big housekeeping things. Aside from if you have a play. A short play or screenplay, yes, yes. or if you have yes. some music that you would like to hear on this podcast, either way, you can send all of those submissions to tglsubmit at gmail.com, and we will read slash listen to all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, promise. and we, we've we actually, for the first time, gotten a few submissions from people that we don't know, which, which is, is really cool. Which is really cool. So if you're one of those people who submitted to us, thank you so much. I we, We've reached out to everyone who's, who's submitted to yes. us, but just an over-the-air waves thank you to everyone, and everyone for listening. Obviously, our podcast is still young, so we're still kind of getting the hang of it, but... Uh, you're getting on the ground floor. Exactly. Of, an of hopefully something cool. Cool, we think, uh, and we really enjoy doing it. It's it's yeah. it's been something to keep our creative juices flowing during this uh, COVID quarantine. So, yes. so we really appreciate everyone for listening and supporting. Yeah, we love you. Thank yeah. you. We love you guys. So, um, before we get into our detours, uh, this week we will be reading Rose by our mm -hmm. friend Michael Sparks, who is another. UNC alum. Another UNC. Or no, I guess he... Did he just graduate this year? No, he he is... He has uh, one more year? Yeah, he has one more year. Never mind. A UNC student. Another another UNC <gasps> chapel thrill. Uh, another Tar Heel, let's say. Yeah, if you're listening another to this and you go to or went to Western Carolina University, please, for the love of <laughs> God, <laughs> submit something. We have gotten one submission that we hope to do soon when we have enough people. 
Yes. But... Yes, yes, yes. Whew. But yeah, yeah we, so, we need some more, man. Yeah. So actually, we'll go. I guess we'll go ahead and say this now. So we did our. We've already done our interview with Michael. We did it a couple days ago, and it was an awesome interview. We had uh, a bunch of uh, cool questions, and he gave us a lot of great responses. If you ask Michael Sparks about anime, he's gonna talk a lot about anime, and that we did is make fine. That mistake. That's that's our mistake. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to have sort of a shortened interview on this episode. And then I think what we're planning to do is releasing just a couple of questions that were a bit longer and all of the anime segment on its own thing. So, as a bonus. Yeah, as, as a little bonus episode. So we'll have the, the Michael Sparks anime section if you want to hear Michael Sparks' opinion on all things anime. It and really lots was of cool. recommendations. Yeah, it, it really, really was good. It was cool. I think It's I'm, just an extra like 20 minutes that we unfortunately couldn't afford to put in the episode proper. Yeah. Um, I think I'm actually going to try to maybe watch either one of the movies or maybe start one of the shows so I can nice. uh, give that as my detour in a week or two. I know, yeah. I think a lot of all the Studio Ghibli films are on HBO now, okay. so we, we can maybe watch one of those. I haven't seen Spirited Away, which is like, Me neither. Which is like a film classic, no matter yeah. anime or not, so I, I know I need to watch that, so maybe that may be coming up next week. Yeah. But for this week, we're going to get into our detours now. Lauren already explained it, so we don't even need to explain it again. <laughs> We're just going to go into just it. Just go right into it. Yeah. Sh I guess, should I start with mine, since it's mostly me, and then we can end with sure. yours, because yeah, we me. both watched it? Okay, cool. Water. Earth. Fire. <laughs> air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. attacked. If you don't know what that is, you are missing out, because I am speaking the beginning of the intro to Avatar The Last Airbender. Every episode, as far as I know, because I've seen four of them. Yes, yes, that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. The, the one for the first episode is actually a little different. It doesn't yeah. go... The beginning is the same, um, I think, and then it, it, it gets a little bit different, or it might be extended. I don't know. I Either think it's way, longer, because it has to explain some more stuff. Exactly, exactly. So Avatar The Last Airbender is a animated series that came out on Nickelodeon... In the mid two thousands, I did I did do a little research. I promise you, I just don't know the exact <laughs> date. So yes, Avatar: The Last Airbender. There are three seasons. What I'm gonna be doing? Three books, excuse me. Three books, which are like seasons. What I'm gonna be doing is each time I watch a new book, I am going to talk about it. So I just finished book one, Water. For a little bit of background on what Avatar is, it is a show about the Avatar, as you know. And um, so, like I said, it's about these four nations. The Water Nation, the Fire Nation, the Earth Nation, and the Air Nation. Um, and they're sort of just like represent different tribes, and they are benders. So they can bend water, fire, earth, air. Each individual tribe has their own thing. Not everyone is a bender, but those benders can sort of manipulate these different elements to their advantage. And the Fire Nation, a hundred years ago, started a war against all the other nations. And the Avatar, who's this series is sort of based around, um, sort of goes through different incarnations. So he goes through a different member of each tribe each time. So he switches tribes each time he is reincarnated. And the last avatar that should have been the one to bring peace and to stop everything, he disappeared. So it's a hundred years later, they're in the midst of this worldwide global war. And the Fire Nation is about to take over yes. everything. Yes, about to take over fully everything. And then these two lovely characters... Katara and Sokka find this young kid in ice with a large flying bison. Yay. And <laughs> and so the series sort of starts there. They find the new avatar, who's this um who's 12 this twelve year old, year old airbender. Yeah, this twelve year old airbender who's been stuck in the ice for a hundred years. He has no idea what's going on. So the story obviously goes through uh Aang's story, who is the Avatar, and sort of learning he has to learn how to bend each element. So this first one, book one, water, is sort of about him learning how to water bend. And it goes through different uh, obviously, since it's the first one, it sort of goes through his story, him finding his way in this new world a hundred years later. And it's really, there are so many things I like about this. And I loved the show when I was a kid. I remember absolutely adoring it. Um, but wh one of the things that I really like about it is, I was actually having this conversation with Blake, our friend who has been on this podcast numerous times. Um, 
It feels like a lot of, especially American animation shows, are so focused on comedy. And it's like, yeah. comedy's the main thing. That's what they do. With this one, it so, focuses so heavily on world building and, like, the lore, the different characters. And, like, and, the relationships, too. Exactly. Yeah. And th- there are many comedic moments throughout. Like, I think there are some brilliant comedic moments. Yeah. But it also... <laughs> like an Ira with all the food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and the characters are so... But the... Yeah. Everything about it is great. This world that they have built is so rich and with so many awesome characters. Another thing that I love about it is that you kind of have parallel stories. So you have Aang, obviously, who's the airbender, who is trying to, you know, learn how to become this great leader who he's supposed to be as this this 12-year-old kid. But then you also have this parallel story of Prince Zuko, who is of the Fire Nation, a banished Fire Nation prince whose main goal is to, like, find and capture the Avatar. Mm -hmm. So you have these two, like, opposing forces, and Zuko's story is also, I find, super compelling. It's like, obviously, he's kind of a jerk and, you know, very hot-headed, has a huge temper... But it's really cool just to see his backstory. He's very complex, and I don't want to spoil anything, but a very complex story. And I thought it was interesting because, obviously, you think fire and you think the foil immediately is water, which to a certain extent is true. Sure. But I think it's honestly more interesting that they have Aang as an airbender and Zuko as a firebender because air and fire work together at times like right to spread fire to, or... yeah or like stoke the fire you like you know you blow on it you provide it with air and if yeah. you remove that oxygen fire can't exist yeah and so i think it's really interesting that that's that push and pull of yeah, the you know the relationship yeah and their relationship progresses i i have watched avatar before once again when i was a kid but it's been so long that i wanted to give myself a new fresh perspective there are also really strong female characters, which is amazing. Katara is is so great, and there are, there are many others. We're actually going to be introduced to a new, a couple new really cool female characters in this uh, second book, which is really awesome. So love that. <sighs> Appa, can we talk about Appa? Yip yip. <laughs> yip yip. He's great. <laughs> I love Appa. Appa's great. I'm giving <laughs> Lawrence... you that look because you're talking for a long time. That's I'm all. sorry. <laughs> Appa's great. The final episode Appa of book is one is great. great. Too. Um, there's really cool things that they do with color. Um, Avatar's great. All right. I'm done. Oh, I'm sorry, Jackson. No, it's fine. Now I feel bad. Well, maybe you should. <laughs> Anyways, no. That's pretty much all I had to say. If you haven't seen Avatar, watch it, because it's 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 fantastic. It's it's really feel good, and it's not. It, it's uh, there's 20 episodes in book one, around 24 minutes each. So it's a breeze. Yeah. And it's on Netflix. So there you go. Lauren. All right. So something that came out uh, a little more recently, Mm -hmm. I'd say a lot more recently, probably. (laughs) Correct. Um, King of Staten Island, starring Pete Davidson, also co-written, co-produced by Pete Davidson. Mm -hmm. And directed and also co-written by Judd Apatow. Yes. Pretty well-known director as well. Um, So it is on Amazon Prime. Uh, Jason's dad actually rented it on Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's not free on Amazon Prime. Right, it's not free on Amazon Prime. Uh, but he rented on Amazon Prime and said, hey, we have it for 48 hours if you guys also want to watch it. And we did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I had to get up really early this morning because we were kind of shooting our own short. But it's like a little over two hours. But I don't know. I'm, I'm really, really glad I watched it because it exceeded my expectations a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was really good. Uh, so King of Satin Island is a very slice of life film. Mm-hmm. And if you're not familiar with the term slice of life, it's definitely a pretty, you know, actory industry type thing. Yeah. But what it basically is, is a play or a screenplay that just sort of captures different moments in life, you know, more like more regular everyday moments. So there might not be, you know, a world ending crisis going on, or there might mm-hmm. not be some, some just like, there might not be some big tragic dramatic event it might seem like the stakes are low, but um, I feel like it's the best way to really get in the minds of characters and see how they operate under normal circumstances versus extraordinary circumstances. Um, and I don't know, I feel like as from an acting perspective, Slice of Life is my favorite thing in the world. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so King of Staten Island, very Slice of Life. Um, I think that style served it very well. Because it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't overly sentimental. 
you know? Mm. And I think it, it definitely could have gone that way. Um, a lot of the premise of it is that it's sort of um, loosely based on Pete Davidson's life and upbringing. Mm. Pete Davidson, a comedian who uh, was on um, SNL, yeah. Yeah. is on SNL. I think he's still on SNL. I haven't watched it in a while. Nah. But in any case, um, but, you know, he, has a, he has a Netflix special too. Yeah, he does. Yeah, maybe a couple. Yeah. Um, he's a stand-up comedian. Yeah, he's a stand-up comedian. Um, but yeah, it's it's loosely based on his own story. Um, his dad was a firefighter who died, and that is also the case for his character in this. His character in King of Satin Island is actually named after his father, Scott Davidson. Which is really sweet. Yeah, it is really sweet. Um, but it's it's basically just about this guy who, you know, has some mental health issues, has some issues just left behind from... Um, his dad passing away when he was seven. Um, he basically is just struggling with feeling like he's not deserving of happiness and not really deserving of, you know, relationships that make him happy and uh, a potential job that would make him happy. And he kind of tends to push himself away from people because he feels that he is self-destructive and destructive to others. Mm -hmm. um, so this movie is kind of his journey of just loving himself more um and by extension loving other people more and yeah. being able to form meaningful bonds with other people and i really enjoyed it um i don't want to spoil too too much but um one of the other major characters is someone you really don't like at the beginning and it's what's his name bill barr Bill Burr. Bill Burr. <laughs> Never mind. Bill Barr is the uh, yeah. attorney general, right? William Barr, yeah. I think they call him Bill. Bill Burr, the, Bill comedian, Burr, the comedian, is, comedian, is the person. He has a big old stash and a bald head. He does. He, he was does. actually in The Mandalorian, which was one of our detours. Maybe it was mine. It was mine, I think. A couple okay. weeks Or ours, well, maybe. It might yeah. have been ours. Either way, we, we anyway, talked about Mandalorian. Yeah, we, we did probably talk know about it. The Mandalorian. He was in an episode of that, and he's one of the major players in this. Mm -hmm. Um, and you really don't like him at the beginning and I hope I'm not spoiling too much, but you do grow to like him by the end of the movie. And, and I think it's, this is one of those movies that's kind of hard to spoil once again, because it's such a slice of life movie. Yeah. It's well, not like it's not anything like happens. Plot twists, yeah, exactly. You know? It's, it's not like a fight club where right. the entire premise of the movie rides on the spoiler. Yeah. But, um, I still haven't seen fight, fight club, but anyway, um, so you, this character's name is Ray. And you grow to like him at the same rate that Pete, da Pete Davidson's character mm -hmm. grows to like him, which I think is something that's really cool because, you know, there aren't really any points where you're rooting for Ray, but Pete Davidson is fighting against him, mm -hmm. at least in my experience. It was very much, um, you, you were on the same path at the same pace. So I thought the pacing was really strong. I really liked that. Yeah. Um, there... You know, in, in most slice of life things, there are so many small moments that I feel like could seem unessential, mm -hmm. but they they just really give you so many clues as to, you know, what the character is, is like when they talk to all kinds of different people and just how they react to different situations. It's really, you know, it's it's really a character over plot based story. Yeah. For sure. For sure. I, I thought the directing it. was excellent as yeah. well. Yeah. I think Judd Apatow did a really good job, especially with... And I think it's part of Judd Apatow's style is to have a lot of improv. And I think when you yeah. have when you have a bunch of comedians, I think that's probably what's best for them. You know, Definitely. is maybe people who don't maybe have traditional acting training. It's sort of good to just let them you know go and do their thing. I thought Pete yeah. Davidson was great. I thought Bill Burr was great. There are a couple other comedians who have like smaller roles that they come in. Yes, Lauren. Oh, also okay. So one of Pete Davidson's friends just talking about improv. Um, at one point, you know, they're like sitting they're all sitting in kind of like beach chairs talking and a bee flies up next to one of them and he just kind of like <laughs> makes a comment and yells at it. And it's just, it's like, it was definitely improvised because the bee just flew up next to him, you know? Yeah. But it was, it was really funny. And it definitely just, it makes those characters more real because it's not an environment where you would ignore a bee that flies up next to you, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. just like, it shows that person's really in touch with the character that he's playing because yeah. that person would yell at a bee. And so. <laughs> it was also a fun little, it's not a cameo because he has a big role, but um, Rico from Hannah Montana. Yeah. He is in this movie looking old, but also greasy, still but... <laughs> very greasy, but still very much the same as when yeah. he played a young boy in Hannah Montana. Um, who Correct else? Uh, Steve Buscemi's in it. He's yes. great. Uh, Marissa Tomei plays... 
Pete Davidson's mom, and mm-hmm. she's great as well. She is um, Aunt May from the newer Spider-Man movies. Yeah, she's she's also she's, she's been great. in a lot of things yeah. as well. That's like um, probably I feel like the most recent like super big thing that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, overall very good, very funny. Uh, definitely yeah. recommend if you very get a chance. Very down to earth, you know. It's yeah, it's yeah. I don't know. It's it's a slice of life. Yeah, you know? it's it's pretty it's awesome. Great. So I think that's all we have, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, when we come back, we will be reading Rose by Michael Sparks. And stay tuned for more. Stay tuned for more green light. Green light. Green light. Green light. Thank you. Uh, I put it at Will unexpectedly, and he did admirably. Okay. <laughs> Very happy Good. to be here. Well, uh, for today, we are going to be reading a script called Rose, written by Michael Sparks. It mm-hmm. is a screenplay. Uh, I will be playing Rose. I will be playing David. And I'll be playing God. And this is, who are you? Who <laughs> are you, God? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Should we clarify that? But, uh, I'm reading stage directions. Okay. <laughs> well, action lines. Action lines. I, also, I always do that. Also, Will is back with us, everyone. Oh, Ooh. hi, everyone. Hi, Will. Happy to be here. Will, yeah. the host of Millennial Trash. That's who. Me. Millennial Trash. When's your next episode coming out? When you can let me borrow your equipment and your closet. It's and Nick's. I don't know. <laughs> Shout out to Nicholas Boffi again, by the way, for the name who uses equipment. Thank you, Nick. Anytime to answer your question, William. And I'll if you're listening, you. uh, Nick, say monkey wrench to us somewhere in the house. That way we'll know you're listening. Nice. That was the code word from last week. In the play? Oh, true. True, true, true. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Without let's go ahead and get ado, started. Yeah. yeah. Rose, written by Michael Sparks. Fade in. Interior, country house, dining room, evening. Eyes open, Rose. Twenties. A robot. Takes in the world around her. The only thing distinguishing her from a human are her shallow eyes. Someone is talking. Voice muffled. The voice belongs to David. Twenties. He paces in front of Rose. He's rambling. Words incomprehensible. His shirt is only half buttoned. David pauses. Do you understand what I'm saying? Rose smiles. The kind of smile where your eyes don't move. Yes, David. What do I call you? Title card. Rose. Begin montage. Country house. Bedroom morning. A clock strikes 8 o'clock a.m. Bedroom morning. Rose makes the bed. Bathroom day. Rose cleans the bathroom. Kitchen day. She washes the dishes, placing them into a rack in time with sound design. David passes by, phone to his ear. Yeah, I know. It's just a rough patch. Oh. I don't know what to do with it. It's just... David stops, eyeing Rose. He clears his throat and exits. Living room. (laughs) David reclines on the couch, book in hand. Rose cleans in the background. Kitchen afternoon. Rose making dinner. And montage. Interior country house, kitchen afternoon. David eats. Rose sits across, staring at him. Her place setting is empty. How was your day, David? He says nothing. They sit in silence. Begin montage, country house. Bedroom morning. The clock strikes 8 o'clock a.m. Bedroom morning. Rose makes the bed. Bedroom morning. She draws the blinds. Bathroom day. Rose cleans the bathroom. She wipes off the mirror. Living room day. Rose cleaning out shelves. David lounges on the couch, reading. She moves books and trash. Loudly. David bristles. Clean somewhere else. And montage. Interior attic later. Rose pulls an old cardboard box out of a closet. Dust kicks up into the air. She opens it. Inside are pictures of David, a happier time. One picture is a woman. She's at the beach, wind blowing her hair, water licking her feet. Rose holds the picture for a moment before flipping it over. On the back. To my love, wish you were here, Alice. What are you doing with that? David rushes in, tearing the picture out of her hand. This stuff isn't for you. David throws the box in the closet. Just... Stay downstairs, okay? I am sorry. It's fine. David's hand grips the door handle. Interior kitchen, afternoon. David and Rose sit at the dinner table. David eating, not looking up at her. The routine. How was your day? Fine. A moment. What is the beach like? He looks up. What? The beach? Sandy, wet, sunny. Why? I was wondering. I've never been. 
David picks at his food. Makes sense. It sounds nice. Yeah. Did you go? A long time ago. Beat. He spins his fork around between his fingers. You do this thing. I'd run up to the waves, wait for the tide to go out, and dig my toes in. Sand would get all stuck in between them and pull out all the sand around, making these little holes. I haven't gone in a while. He clears his throat. Did you go with Alice? I want some quiet. Sleep. She freezes. We cut to a wide shot. Dead silent. Kitchen later. Rose washes the dishes. Push in on the dishes, the rushing water, and the sound design transports us to exterior beach sunset. We see the waves crash against the sand. Close-ups. The water rushing, feet in the ocean, hair blowing back, the sun. We see Rose, staring. Hard cut back to interior kitchen night. Rose washing dishes. Her hand misses the rack and drops a plate. Crash. Push in on the plate. Interior bedroom, morning. Rose is wide awake, eyes focused on David's sleeping face. He stirs. Good morning, David. Morning. He rubs his eyes and starts to sit up, groaning. After a moment, he gives up, slumping back down. He wipes his face. What's my schedule? You have a meeting with Alice at three. David closes his eyes. Deep breath. Are you all right? He doesn't respond. Rose stares at him with her unblinking eyes. Do you want me to set an extra place at the table for tonight? David finally looks over at her. His mouth doesn't move. If she's coming back with you... He lurches out of bed. She silences immediately. I'm heading out. Make sure it looks good here when I get back. He pulls on a white button down. Pauses. Oh, and Rose? Make that extra place at the table tonight. He exits. Rose lies on the bed. Bathroom. Day. Rose washes out the sink, scrubbing it clean. She turns her focus to the mirror. Wipe. Her hand slows. She looks at the face in the mirror, its hands touching hers. She moves her hand back in front of her, hovering. Her fingers brush against her hair, tracing the outline. She looks back up, staring at herself. The hand falls. Kitchen. Night. The table is set for two. Rose stands by the sink, washing her hands. The door slams. David's feet drag across the floor. How was your day? She turns. David stands in the middle of the room his shirt unbuttoned and wrinkled, his tie undone. His eyes are glued on the table. What the hell is that? Dinner. He points at one of the plates. Throw that shit away. We don't need that. Rose grabs the extra plate, tossing its contents in the trash. Will Alice not be joining us for- Rose jerks to the side with barely enough time to dodge the projectile aimed at her head. It's the other plate. It smashes into the wall, sending plaster and food everywhere. Stay out of my business, Rose. David. I said stop listening to everything I say. His breathing slows down. Clean this mess up. Stay out here tonight. He leaves. Rose cleans the food off the floor, staring at the shattered remains of the plate. She stands in the middle of the kitchen, closing her eyes. Kitchen. Morning. Rose stands in the same spot, unmoving, her eyes open. She looks around. The house is silent. She moves to the living room. The bedroom door is closed. Her hand touches the wood. A moment. Attic. The door where David put the photo box. Rose stands close, hand almost touching it. She hesitates. Kitchen. Rose sits at the table, photograph in her hand. It's the picture from before. Alice. Smiling, happy, laughing. To my love, wish you were here. Alice. Rose stares at the photograph for a long while. Finally, a smile. A chair moves. David sits across from Rose. She quickly lowers the photo. He doesn't look at her. She always loved the beach. Rose brings the photo back up. David grabs it as she places it on the table. He chuckles. (laughs) I was out one night and saw this girl up to her head in water. Thought she was drowning. Ran out to save her, but she didn't need it. Turns out I wasn't nearly the swimmer I thought I was. His smile turns. She saved me. You loved her. Their eyes meet. They truly look at each other as if it's the first time. A brief flash of understanding. Yes. I did. He takes the photo and hands it to Rose. Her fingers tighten around it. Close on the photograph. Exterior beach, blue hour. Rose holds the photo in her hands. She lowers it. She stands by the ocean, water washing over her feet. She steps back slightly, but then embraces it, squeezing the wet sand with her toes. The water gets higher and higher as Rose runs faster against it. A wave crashes over her, sweeping off her feet. She laughs, a genuine laugh. She stands up, now completely soaked. 
She laughs again and goes back to run into the water. The end. Everybody, welcome back to the Green Light, Green Light. Podcast. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, that is Lauren, and I am Jackson, as you all are probably well familiar. You are not, however, well familiar with our guest today. Uh, you have heard his uh, script, Rose. Um, his name is Michael Sparks, and he's a lovely, lovely human being. Really, at this point, he's a human being. Uh, oh, okay. I was like, at first I was like, where are you going with that, Lauren? Yes. <laughs> Fun fact about Michael, he loves beans more than any human being I know. So, Michael, how are you today? I'm doing all right. How are you? Doing doing so doing good, well. man. Doing so good. Um, good. So, yeah, why, why, why don't we just, like, jump straight into it? So, um, we're going right. to start you off with a, with a little bit of an easy one. Um, just, we would sort of like to hear like your screenwriter origin story. How'd you get into writing? And I guess for you, how'd you sort of get into film in general? Obviously you're a, a multifaceted person. So just in general, how'd you get into film? Oh, okay. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think condensed version. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, I read Lord of the Rings and I loved it. And I was like, okay, I need to make, I need to write something. So I wanted to write books. Uh, and so I like wrote all these little short stories, like, you know, just like, you know, kind of more prose stuff. And then in 10th grade, my English teacher gave us this assignment where we could basically do whatever we wanted to do. And I wanted to write a book in a, cor- a semester, uh, which was dumb. But uh, my friend wanted to act in something. And he said, oh, oh why don't you write like a script for this short film we're going to do um, that he wanted to act in? And I was like, OK, I've never written a uh, short film before and then also we didn't have anyone to film it so I, I just thought I might do that as well um, and so we wrote this thing uh, and filmed it uh, even though we had the entire semester we wrote the whole thing and filmed it in literally a day because we put it off the entire time but uh, mm-hmm. and it wasn't the best but it's funny because after that um, I did it. I liked it so much, even though the project uh, product wasn't the best thing in the world. I just decided to keep doing and keep doing. And yeah, that's kind of how I just got started through that you know, project. Nice. Sure. I love yeah. um, it's so interesting. Ellie's uh, origin story is kind of similar, I feel like. Just like, you know, one piece of thing that, like, inspired you. For her, it was The Princess Bride. Um, Yeah. And then uh, for you, it was Lord of the Rings. It's just so cool how, like, a story can, like, sort of inspire you to sort of take up the mantle of storytelling. I I love stories like that. No, I I was just going to say, yeah, it's because I read Lord of the Rings, I wanted to write more. And because I wrote more, my teacher, like, I showed my writing to my teacher, and she said, oh, why don't you read this for the class? And so I did that, and because I did that, I like started talking more and then I wanted to do acting. So I did acting and then, you know, I just kind of went from there. Just snowballed from there. Yeah. A a big (laughs) old snowball you are today, Michael. (laughs) Oh gosh. (laughs) So we will get back to your, um, you know, I guess your, your numerous roles in filmmaking a little bit later, but Mm -hmm. for right now to bring it back to this story, uh, what was your inspiration for this story? How did you come up with this idea? Huh? I, so my favorite film um, and it kind of, it goes back and forth between two, uh, but my favorite film is Her uh, by Spike okay. Jones. Um, and I saw that and I really loved, the thing I really loved about it was the romance in it, besides, you know, being from, you know, between a, you know, human and an AI, it was very pure in the fact that, you know, it wasn't about all the other things that generally you know, the conflicts and stuff that you usually find in romance films about like, oh, like they're moving away, blah, 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 blah. It was more about the pure, like essential quality of like, why do they like each other? How does this relationship work? And like, it's Mm -hmm. very mature, I think, in the way it approaches the relationship more so than I think, you know, a lot of like romance films you see where there's like, you know, melodrama and stuff. It was like very, I felt realistic. Um, And what I wanted to do with Rose and kind of what shifted, like, originally I wanted to do, like, you know, more of a relationship between, um, you know, 
uh, David and Rose, but it kind of shifted to me wanting to portray like this love that someone has not necessarily for someone else, but like the idea of like falling in love, but less with a specific person and just more how like that affects, you know, someone. That I think that's really cool because I think that's something that Lauren and I both noted is that yeah, we were actually going to ask you a question later. Like, oh, it's interesting that you didn't make them fall in love. Yeah. You know? So you but, son of a gun for uh... already taking one of our <laughs> questions. But um, no, it, I, I, I really like this script because it really it's not just like a traditional love story or it's like I feel like in right. a lot of these stories you see like the human and the AI fall in love and that's like cool or whatever. But, you know, it's been done. I think in this one, like you said, it's sort of just about, you know, finding just love and wherever that is maybe that's not the other person um yeah but and it's... even just finding you know because i i feel like it feels like rose just really wants to be a human and really wants to experience these human things and that's mm. almost more important than you know any love or any relationship that she could have potentially had with david mm -hmm. so right. yeah i thought that was really cool yeah um so, so i guess I guess this really doesn't fully jump off of that, but it's in the same vein. Um, so when I, I thought it was interesting when I first read this script, in my head, I was picturing David as the protagonist. And I, that, that could be from previous movies where I've seen, you know, the human be the protagonist or my male bias of just <laughs> seeing another dude. But when I read it again, I was like, this is Rose's story. It mm -hmm. really is about Rose sort of finding herself and finding what it means to be human. So I'd love to hear you sort of talk about that and where, where that sort of inspiration came from to have uh, Rose sort of be the driver of this story. Um, I think part, part of it, you know, like you say, like there are so many stories of this person getting or making or falling in love with the AI or something is generally told through the guy's perspective. And, you know, um, but I thought it would be interesting to tell it through the perspective of her uh, as this AI gaining sentience, but less in the way of gaining sentience to, you know, leave or like become more human in a way like that is definitely a part. Um, but I thought it was very interesting to and and obviously like it's shorter, so I couldn't explore it like as much as I wanted to. Um, but I thought it was interesting to attack it from her perspective because it I wanted to approach what it is that like love and passion means to us as people and how that drives the way we think, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we were really interested in there was one specific moment with Rose that we both really liked. Oh, I love this moment. Um so I'm just going to kind of uh, read, read a quote from the script. So Mike, a little bit of Michael reacts here. Yeah. So, so yeah. Just, just, <laughs> reacts to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rose washing dishes. Her hand misses the rack and drops a plate. Crash. Push in on the plate. So Jackson kind of had the idea of maybe it's <gasps> supposed to... I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to tell him that oh, part okay, yet. Okay, okay. So, Never so mind. <laughs> yeah. Just sort of your initial reaction to that and what you were trying to do with that moment. Yes. Mm. It's. I think what I was trying to do is how, how to say it exactly. I think it was something to the idea of like David or anyone who would create, you know, a robot of this fashion. Um, you know, you want someone who can help you around the house or like do these things and you want them to be quote unquote perfect. Mm -hmm. But there's also like that human element to it or like learning element and by becoming more like human and feeling things, there are errors or mistakes that are introduced. Yeah. You know, so it's like if everything is perfect and ordered and never and nothing ever gets messed up, it's very hard to approach, I feel like. And so by having, you know, subtle mistakes and like errors and things start popping up, it kind of like reinforces this human element that's awakening i think absolutely i that's yeah. that's that's mostly what i was thinking but i also love how 
There's that moment later in the script when David throws um, a plate against a wall, and there's kind of a mm-hmm. moment where Rose looks at that. And I just thought it yeah. was these these two beautiful moments of humanity kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. Because for Rose, it sort of represents her like starting to feel and starting to experience mm-hmm. things, starting to become a human. And then for David, on the other hand, it's coming out of this like rage and it's kind of this desire to like stop feeling in a way. Like I want to stop feeling sad. I want to stop feeling bad. I'm just trying to get this anger out of me. So I just I yeah, thought it was right. that that really cool contrast mm. between that yeah. moment towards the beginning and that moment towards the end. Mm. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I honestly didn't even think about that. But you bring <laughs> you bringing that up. No, I totally thought about that. That was my intention for the yeah, beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Michael, yeah. we'll cut that part out, and and we it's will. All you. It's, it's all, all you. you. It's all you, buddy. It's all you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man, no, there was one time I was uh, just just speaking of writers. You know, sometimes not always like planning everything that other people read into in their scripts. Um, there was one time I was in a play, and you know. I was supposed to be a, a shark who I was like a shark for half of the play and like a, a like a Greek mythology siren for the other half, okay. but I wore the same yeah. costume. So in my head, I justified it as being like, oh, well, both of them are like death and one of them is appealing and one of them is scary. And I mentioned yeah. that because one of my one of my teachers wrote it and I mentioned that to him and he was like, oh, I never thought of that. I just thought like she was being two different characters. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I love that. That's so funny. That is so great. Um, so um, bringing it back to your lovely, lovely scripts, Michael. Yes, yes. Um, and so I, I noticed that you there's a lot of like sensory information here. Um, like for a few examples, like, you know, when uh, David is like describing the beach, there's the feeling of like the sand between his toes. And then with Rose, like her fingers tightening around a picture, like hands grazing wood, like tracing the outline of her face. And I was just wondering, like, obviously that means a lot for this script because, mm-hmm. you know, that's sort of kind of one of the right. themes. But do you do you tend to incorporate like more sensory information in a lot of your scripts? Um, and if so, how, what role do you sort of think that plays for like someone who's reading it i think for me uh one thing i definitely fall into with my scripts uh a lot because i you know film stuff is that i love describing what pe- what characters see and feel mm-hmm. um because while you'd be able to see that in the actual film element when you're reading i feel like it puts you in their shoes a little bit because you're mm-hmm. like imagining like the textures and like the view and the looks that they're saying. And I like, I honestly like describing scenery and like actions a lot more than dialogue sometimes uh, because it can be really hard for me. Like I write the whole thing and like, I literally write like the most baseline dialogue ever when I'm like (laughs) writing through something the first time, but I spend way too much time on the action lines and like making them really concise and like, you know, um, descriptive. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just like, "Uh, I don't know what to say, but uh, I feel like, like one of the reasons I did the whole thing with, um, you know, David describing the beach um, and like those feelings is I think the element of memory is so core in this. And like, because one of the things I guess I wanted to say was that like memory defines, you know, who we are and how we interpret things. Mm -hmm. And by describing like the memories in this like kind of ultra sensory way, I feel like it not only, you know, puts Rose in that space that David occupied, but also the audience as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think I think from an acting perspective, too, I would much rather um, see a writer who, you know, describes every single thing that they're seeing and touching rather than saying, oh, well, they feel, you know, nostalgic or they Mm. they feel a, a yearning or, you know, something like that. Which is, you know, what you could have done for this, but I, from an acting perspective, it's much easier to say, oh, I feel this, and then you can sort of deduct uh, how you would react to it. Sorry, did I say, did I, I feel this or yes, I see this? you said it. I meant to say, <laughs> sorry, it's, for an actor, it's much easier to, to see the words and see what you're seeing and then deduct mm. how you feel from that rather right. than, you know, it's, it's much more challenging for the, for the actor if a writer says, you know, you feel this. And you have to figure out what you're seeing and touching and whatever in order to get there. So, mm, yeah. yeah. So I like that style a lot. It's more freeing as an actor, I feel Definitely, like that way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I always like to ask this. What is your favorite moment in the script? Like you wrote it and you were like, this is it. This is genius. If I change everything else in the script, I'm keeping this. <laughs> oh, the ending. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Easily. yeah. Easily. I mean, like, because uh, I'm trying to adapt it into a feature, and the ending was the first thing I, you know, put in there. It's like, that has to be there. I feel like because it, it's... Like I love, like I really dig it, and like looking back, I still, I still like it, like the whole a lot. But the ending is just, I, I love, I love the ending so much because there are no words, and yeah. it's just actions. And I know sometimes like crying can be like melodramatic or whatever, um, but I feel that, like the joy of like playing is something like so core um and so raw i feel like because a lot of the times you know people put up their guards for conversations Mm -hmm. or you know whatever like especially with david throughout the whole thing and like rose you know because she's developing like in the end like she's actually able to express these things in such a pure heartfelt way that i think that's really i just i love i love moments where people are able to you know express like raw emotion i think Yeah, for sure. And I feel like, you know, from her perspective of it's like going between, okay, well, I want to be human and human means Mm -hmm. having all these emotions. But then, you know, being around someone who doesn't want me to express all those emotions means that I can't, you know, and it it really almost just reminds me of like, just especially how, you know, men are generally expected to act. Where, you know, well, they want to have all of these emotions and be freed, but, you know, you feel like you can't around these people, so you kind of just feel blocked. So I think that that's similar to what happens for Rose, where, you know, she wants to be human and she wants to be free to express herself, but she kind of can't in the environment that she's in, and she has a similar sort of cathartic release. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love, I love, I love the ending as well. Um, I also love the uh the last moment between uh david and rose um Mm -hmm. where um he he talks about first meeting alice and then like um the how you know he he thought that she was drowning and he ran out or he swam out and then uh it turns out he says like it turns out she was a stronger swimmer than i thought and you know that double meaning of she saved me is like you know i love that i thought that was great yeah, it's it's like I think one of the things I really wanted to kind of express with like that, too, is like I feel like the reason why David, you know, David's relationship um, with Alice like didn't turn out uh, was because of him like being too controlling, mm-hmm. like sure. with you see with Rose and like, you know, the whole thing, like he felt like he had to go save her mm-hmm. when she could, you know, she ended up, you know, being, she ended up being very capable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Bravo, sir. Yes. Bravo on, <laughs> on that ending. Um, so now we're gonna we're gonna shift a little bit, Michael. Uh, we're gonna shift mm-hmm. from your script to you. Uh, so I, I guess th- this first question isn't really like about you, <laughs> but it is about your opinion. So uh, mm-hmm. I assume you are familiar with the film Blade Runner, correct? Oh, love Blade Runner. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I I I knew. I believe we've had conversations about it before. So, in your opinion, do you think? Uh, Harrison Ford's character, Deckard, do you think he's a replicant or a human? Well, <laughs> if you've seen 2049, yes. I feel like that kind of confirms that he's a human. Sure, sure. Um, but, ah, man, I mean, I, I like, before, before 2049 came out, like, I feel like, like, I would have said he was a replicant. Mm-hmm. Just because of, you know, like, if, if you watch the Final Cut version, like, all of the, the setup with, like, the unicorn and the dreams and all that stuff. Uh, but then, you know, in 2040, like, I love 2049 so much um, um, in so many ways. And I, I feel like that kind of, like, changed it. Mm-hmm. But in a way that I feel like the fact that since they say that he's human, it makes it, I don't know. It, it's it's hard to think. Uh, it's think like, about it makes it almost a little more suspicious. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> for sure. I, I think I think he's a human. Okay. Final answer: human. I like that. You heard it here um, first. Yeah. Well, because it's it's it is so interesting because it's like you know I was I was reading a couple articles today about how I think you know after the um, Ridley Scott released the final cut or whatever he said that he was a replicant 
but right. then but Harrison Ford, Ford whenever he was interviewed, yeah, said, thought that he was a human. Yeah. Hmm. So it's it's so interesting just to see that that the difference it's like in opinion. a little opinion. bit of a disparity there. Yeah, yeah. So I guess even to this day, it can be debated, which is why I wanted to ask you. Um, but yeah, I love your I, answer. I feel like I, I feel like honestly, like just one final like thought of of that. Like even even looking at the final cut. Now that I think about it, I think him being a human is profound because like when he has that final confrontation with uh, Ray, Mm -hmm. I can't, uh, with Ray, uh, that's his name, right? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. 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 When he has, when he has the final confrontation with Ray and Ray, you know, just like, I, I like, you know, he's describing like these visuals and stuff. And I think I watched Blade Runner, like I've, watch it frequently but i watched it like before i'd written rose and like i kind of took inspiration from that final scene of like ray describing like these things that he's seen that will never be seen by anyone else as he dies Mm. um i think it's profound that if deckard is a human like that telling of memory and how essential that is to like what humanity is like this idea of like you know our memories literally create who we are and like replicants are implanted with these memories i think that like scene like ties it together in a way that sets him up as this human that i think it's more interesting to me of him being a human rather than have it being a rec- replicant with these like memories implanted you know what i mean yeah mm-hmm. i agree i agree i think i fall on the side of of he's a human as well i think if a gun to my head um I would say human as well. Lauren, do you have an opinion? Have you seen Blade Runner? I have not seen Blade Runner. You should see it. Ah, Lauren. I know. It's, uh, it's a, it is it is a classic. Um, yeah. So so we teased this one earlier. This one is a question about you, Michael. So buckle in. We <laughs> we we teased it earlier, but uh, you you're obviously you're very multi talented. So you write, you direct, you're a cinematographer, you, you act. Eat beans. You eat beans. Yes, I the, do. So <laughs> many. We know beans trump all, but beans. <laughs> Yeah. Putting putting aside beans. Um beans in many ways. Yes. <laughs> so f- Mary Kill acting, I group together directing and writing, and cinematography. So those three categories, f- Mary Kill. Uh mm. So I guess it's like, you know, you do one once in a while maybe. Uh one is your main and then yeah. you, you never do one again. Who do you main, Michael? Is Who also main? another way. <laughs> Uh, who do you mean and hard. who do you mean? True. Nice. Who do I mean and who do I mean? Ah, lol. <laughs> um, God, that was gross. Why did I say lol out loud? <laughs> We're certainly keeping uh, that, Michael. Everyone's going <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> Good. Um, hmm, I think... Man, I like. I think about this a lot because, I okay, I feel like the first one, I'd probably acting... I'd say kill. I love acting a lot, mm-hmm. but in terms of, you know, what I want to do, like I, I do enjoy acting, but it's more of a vessel to support and like learn how to do my other stuff. Sure. Um, but I feel like, <sighs> Oh, uh, um, that's crap. okay. We can be- uh, bleep that out too. <laughs> darn. This is hard. Um, it, it goes back and forth, but I feel like, Cinematography is probably Mary mm. and directing slash writing is. Okay. Um, that's, I, I think that's, that's interesting. Cause I, I thought, I thought maybe putting directing and writing together would be a little too OP, but it's, it's good to know that it wasn't. Um, <laughs> cause I love, I love writing and I love like, like, cause it, it's really, it's really hard. Because I love the idea of like craft it, like the like making visuals and like filming stuff is like what I what brings me like I think the most joy, but mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. being able to have control of that is also something for sure. Like you know, directing like story wise, of course. But um, I the adding directing to writing makes it more difficult for sure. But um, like I you know would have no issue like doing something someone else has written. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Gotcha. So, kind of bouncing off of that, thankfully now you don't have to separate them anymore. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to get rid of any of them. Yeah. But uh, how do you find that they interact with each other? So, do you feel that doing any one of those things has made you better at all the others, and how? Like, including acting? Like yeah, acting. yeah, yeah. Including them all. Acting's alive again. 
good, good, good. Yeah, I've got to bring acting back. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because when I like when I started doing you know film stuff, it was from the perspective of I literally did you know acting, writing, directing, and cinematography for the first film I did. Mm-hmm. Like it was the horrible. And at the horrible, beginning, it's horrible. always like out of necessity. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I have a crew of one. Yeah, Yeah, God, it was the worst. Like I I'd literally set up the camera. Like my friend would be in shot. I'd like focus it. I'd like I had like a dynamic microphone like connected to my computer because I didn't have like a thing. It was the worst thing ever. Um, Do you still have that video, Michael? And if so, can you send it? Oh yeah, I still have the video. Oh, that's Um, amazing. Oh God, it's also like, oh man, I like put this like really cheesy music throughout the entire thing oh, it's 13 yes. minutes it's 13 minutes long but the weird i like recut it a year later with no music just like you know rain and like you know sound effects the director cut stuff. it down to like four minutes and it was so much better even though it was still pretty bad <laughs> sure but um i literally used like the insanity monologue you know where it's like oh like uh, and i named the characters paul and robert um like paul had like kidnapped robert and was torturing him uh, there was no real plot, uh, but it turns <laughs> out my brother, my brother's names are Paul and Robert. And oh man, what I didn't a even, coincidence! I, I didn't even, I didn't even think about it. And my brother watched it and was like, "Michael, you got something to say to me?" <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, "Oh God, no." Um, but uh, okay. Um, but how do they influence each other? I think through doing more, you know, theater uh, in college and writing more. I feel like for me doing a lot of acting has informed how I look at characters um, because, you know, when you approach a script and obviously reading scripts makes you like better at understanding the story because you know more Mm -hmm. stories, but you know, when like for all of my directors I've had, they always get us to approach our characters in a way where we break down their motivations, what they want, how they go to get it. And also like firmly establishing that, you know, even the most despicable of characters are to them are not bad. And they're trying to accomplish something positive in their mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, it's like, and it could be something terrible, but it's like a positive goal, you know, positive in terms of like moving themselves forward. Of course. Yeah. Uh, And so, through that, I feel like, honestly, that is what's helped me advance my writing the most hmm. because it made me really focus on, like, what our characters doing that is active and pushing forward their own goals. Um, so I feel like acting has definitely helped my, like, story, like, my writing ability. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And directing as well because, you know, if you, like, have acting experience, you can better approach actors and like talk to them um instead of like you know just i don't know like eating food in the background and just yelling um yeah <laughs> uh just eating beans and like doing nothing um, <laughs> uh, but uh and then i feel like for cinematography like it's interesting because uh like a lot of my experience has been through filming you know weddings uh commercials and like vlogs uh and you know as you both know uh and the la vlog will be coming out soon uh hey uh, sometime <laughs> ah but uh anyway um like filming filming like like i love i love doing cinematography for feature films and, uh, or not feature films but like for narrative stuff but filming vlog style stuff i love so much because mm-hmm the obviously like things can still be you know like curated Mm -hmm. but it's you're capturing like these actual moments and they can be rough they can be like awkward like the shots might not look good but like when i was editing like uh my 2019 video um i was like interspersing i threw out shots that like looked better just because there were shots i felt like captured better emotion yeah Mm-hmm. And it's something I love and I really want to try to capture with my like narrative stuff, because when you're filming something that has been written and is like so curated, it's I feel like it's so hard to capture like actual like real emotion. Like obviously, like that's up to like a lot of directing, like acting and like staging as well. But like 
how do you film it in a way that helps you portray that emotion in a way that the audience can feel it? And mm -hmm. I feel like through acting and like understand, like through acting and getting to understand characters and like people better, I'm able to like film in a way and it helps me kind of know what to focus on and what not to focus on because you know like my first wedding i've ever filmed i filmed like an hour of people eating food and mm -hmm. i didn't use any of that because that's disgusting no <laughs> yeah. one wants to watch people yeah. eat food and it also was like the bougiest wedding i'd ever been to in my entire life like this family was so rich and they were like eating lobster and stuff and i was like no one wants to see this yeah i just want to see them kiss and get married and go away um they don't want to like, see them prying apart the lobster yeah exactly yes. god oh god like the you know, juice is like hammer, dripping, yeah. <laughs> dripping off of the hands. But it's like, I feel like through doing each thing, it's mostly about like cutting the fat because, and, and this is something I might fall into like too much sometimes with my writing where I like cut so much that there's like, you know, it's too subtle, mm -hmm. but it's about knowing what you can cut out and what you can keep mm -hmm. because mm -hmm like especially with directing and I'm rambling at this point um, but this is my final final like thing I feel like one of the things that helps them all synergize is by doing and learning story you're able to understand like your end goal more concretely and what exactly you're trying to say and by mm -hmm. knowing what that is you can know okay I should focus on getting this kind of content, like these kind of shots, like putting in this effort into my acting, like this is what I should reinforce. This is what I should focus on with the directing. Whereas like things like that are minor, you know, you can, you don't have to focus on as much because if you focus on everything equally, nothing's going to stand out. Right. And I feel like that's the thing that doing all of them helps out so much is it helps you know what to prioritize on and what to focus on to get the most impact in your narrative. Yeah, man. Yeah. I think you said all that beautifully. There is literally nothing we could even try to add, even if we wanted to. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah, that was that was great, and I really appreciate a lot of the things that you said. Um, but I think that's all the questions we have. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything real quick that you want to plug, Michael? Um, anything that I want to plug? <laughs> this light bulb. <laughs> Sorry. Boo. Um, Boo. Um, <laughs> No, um, I, going back to Rose, I actually have filmed it, um, and I am planning on releasing it sometime soon, um, hopefully within the next few weeks, uh, my friend who's composing it, um, is working on finishing up the music, obviously with everything going on, there's been a delay, sure, um, sure. but sometime soon it'll be coming out and I hope everyone um, we'll get the chance to see it. Great. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, we'll definitely post, you know, if you give us an update when it's out and a way that we can share it, we'll definitely share it on our page so everyone listening can watch it. Yeah. yeah. Of course. And yeah. if you if you want to collaborate with Michael on any future things, Michael, I hope this is okay that we're going to include, like, an email for you in the description of the episode. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, great. So if you want to collaborate with Michael on anything or just pick his brain about anime, uh, we will leave his email <laughs> in the description uh, below. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's all we have. Michael, thank you so much for coming on again. This was yeah. really awesome. Amazing. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. I hope I didn't ramble too much. No, <laughs> of course not. All right. Oh thanks, man. Uh, talk to all you right. later. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.